Hi, this is Jason. This is a, a Blender tutorial about assembly animations. Um, some tips and tricks on how to use the snap tool to assemble your parts. And then um, we're going to go to the end of our t animation timeline, record keyframes to record the location of all these assembled parts, and then work backwards through the timeline to uh, disassemble this thing. Um, to get started here, what we have are two 2x4s two and a Simpson strong tie. A Simpson strong tie is a galvanized steel formed bracket used to strengthen joints and wood assemblies. Um, my go-to tool when I'm assembling parts that I've modeled is the snap tool. It's this magnet. You can also turn it on and off by pressing shift tab. By default the snap element is increment which will move an object I believe one blender unit, but you can see it snapping to a grid. The next three snap elements, vertex, edge, and face. You can snap face to face, edge to edge, vertex to vertex. I use vertex most often. When you choose vertex, it gives you another choice. You can choose a snap target. You can experiment with those. I'm going to use closest. When you use a snap tool, probably good practice to rough in your location. You want to make sure that if you're using a vertex snap, el snap element you want your cursor to be close to the, your, the vertex that you're trying to snap. Then move toward the vertex of the neighboring object. You'll see an orange circle. That's your indicator that you've snapped to a vertex. Left click to place and you're finished. Now, just to demonstrate, if I move my cur my air my cursor over into space here and press G for grab, you can see that the snap is not working. Uh, so that is why you want your cursor to be close to the vertex in which in, that you intend to use to first snapping. Now I'm going to snap the Simpson strong tie to the two x four. The Simpson strong tie has a cutout here. Intended for intended for this upright 2x4. I'm going to rough in the location. I want the inside corner of the strong tie to snap to the outside corner of the 2x4. I'm showing you this only to demonstrate that the snap tool does not always work. So you can see the this, there's very clearly a vertex here by my cursor and I'm going to snap that vertex to the outside vertex of the 2x4 and it never works. I've never been able to get it to work. Okay, so when the snap tool does not work for you, here's the workaround. Shift S is another snap tool. Okay, I'm going to left click into space so that you can see my 3D cursor and also see the origin of the Simpson strong tie. I'm going to press Shift S and this menu has several selections. The first one I'm going to show you here is snapping the selection to cursor. So my selection, the Simpson strong tie, the origin of that selection is going to snap to the 3D cursor. And there you can see it moved. So the workaround is to strategically place the origin of one part, first of all, and then secondly, strategically place the 3D cursor onto a second part, the part to which you want to snap. I'm going to tab into edit mode on the Simpson strong tie to move the origin. I need to move the 3D cursor to where I want it to be, which is the inside corner. You choose the vertices that you, you choose where you need to move the, the um, origin. You know, sometimes you need to choose carefully. In this case, I don't necessarily need to. I can press Z to go into wireframe and I can choose all these vertices and snap to the median here where the widget is currently or I can just choose one vertex. You're going to have to make that decision as you're practicing and working. Okay, I chose one vertex and I'm going to press Shift S and I'm going to snap. I can also snap my cursor to a selection so I'm going to snap my cursor to that vertex. Press A to deselect, tab into object mode because I have to be into object mode in order to move the origin. I'm going to press Control, Control, Shift, Alt, C. And I'm going to move the origin to the 3D cursor. Watch the widget move. There it moved. So now I have strategically placed the origin of one part. Now I'm going to press Z to go back into solid mode view. 
Now I'm going to right click to select the 2x4 tab into edit mode. I'm going to right click to shift to select right click to select this vertex on the outside corner to which I want to snap. Press shift S to snap the cursor to the selected. A to deselect tab into edit mode. So now I have strategically placed my 3D cursor. I'm going to right click on the Simpson strong tie. Shift S snap selection of cursor. Now it has snapped the way that I wanted it to. That is the workaround when the snap tool doesn't work. When I was working on this assembly before, I wasn't able to get the snap tool to work in the Z direction very well either. I want the 2x4s to rest on these inside surfaces. Um, but it's, it's not working the way I would like for it to work. So I would have to do the workaround once again. But I, I'm going to tell you, well, one other thing I've learned in Blender is if it looks right, it is right. And I've actually heard somebody else say that. Um, and that's come in handy. Uh, this is not engineering software. If you do need it, it to be perfect, you know, do what you need to do with the, the two different snap tools shown here, you'll be able to achieve what you need to achieve. But in this case, I'm just going to pretend like a splinter got stuck. And uh, there's a little bit of an air gap there. That's okay. Got a little dusty, got a little dirty. Hey, these things happen. Okay, so that's, I'm fine with that. Now to show you the workflow a little bit, I'm going to select this 2x4, Shift D to duplicate, G to grab, R to rotate, Z for the Z axis, 90 degrees. My snap tool is still on, so I'm going to move my 2x4. You can see it is snapped where I want it. Now I'm going to press G again because I want it to get the Z location, the Z position correct also. I'm going to rough this in real quick. As you can see, if you don't rough it in, it could snap vertices that you don't intend to have snapping could snap. If that happens, kind of rough, rough your location in a little bit first and then try again as you can see there. That's kind of what the workflow looks like when you're putting together your assembly. If you are modeling without a cup of coffee, for shame. Mm. Okay. Another thing I want to show you is our bolts and screws, aligning them with holes. If you have never used the bolt factory, if you click on File, User Preferences, Add-ons, make sure you're in the All category. In this search field, type in the word Bolt, and you'll see Bolt Factory. Check mark that. Um, if you haven't used it before, you know, Shift A to add a mesh and you can add a bolt. You can experiment with that or do a search on it to find a tutorial on the bolt factory. Um, I used a screw, this is wood, so I used a screw. Um, you can modify a bolt to look like a screw. You could just model a screw. Or what I, what you could also do is you can import STL files. That's a very, it's a relatively common shared file among engineers, designers, drafters. And uh, you can import STL files into Blender. So there are communities that share these models, common parts like screws, gears, what have you. So what I did was I did a Google search on wood screw STL. STL is a file type. And there is a website called grabcad.com that is a good, good website. If you use anything here, you know, you can look for any kind of licensing requirements. Um, typically there aren't, but just look around. Uh, you know, I would probably credit the author or the creator um, of the model. But if it, when, you, once you, when you first click on the download button, um, it's going to have you register. It's free. And I've never had any problems using this website, so that is a suggestion there. Um, Again, importing an STL file, you, you click on File, Import, and go to STL. And there are all different types of file types you can import. Um, 
And if you don't see a file type that maybe you expect to, to see, um, go to back to File User Preferences and there's an Import Export category in the add-ons and you might find your file type there. Step file type is not there, I checked. I didn't see it. Okay, I'm gonna click on my screw. You have to navigate through your windows and find your screw STL file, I'm gonna import it. And you can see I have a really big screw here. Two, thing, um, two things I'm gonna do with the screw real quick. I'm going to add an edge split modifier. And then I'm going to click the smooth but shading button. That'll make that thing nice and smooth. Now I'm going to begin to rotate and scale. So I'm going to press R to rotate it on the Z axis 180 degrees. And begin to scale it down to, mat to fit my hole. I'm going to press Shift S, or I'm sorry, Shift Tab to turn the snap tool off for right now. I'm just kind of roughing in the scale. I'm not getting it necessarily perfect. Okay. That looks good there. Okay. Now, um, I've scaled this thing, I've rotated it, and I'm gonna tell you this. Oh, I, I think I'd go as far as saying almost all of the problems you are ever going to have in Blender are due to two things. Number one, you must apply rotation and scale. Number two, be mindful of where your origin is. If you will do those two things, I mean, the spin tool is dependent upon that. Almost all of your modifiers, um, animation, it, th there's a lot that, that rides on those two things. Okay, so let me sh show you here. The screw, if I open up my panel here, you can see the screw's been rotated 180 degrees on the Z-axis. It's also been scaled. Now it has a .034 scale. I want to zero that all out and I'm going to do that by having the screw selected and I'm going to press control A and I'm going to apply both the rotation and the scale. Once I do that, the scale is now 111. It's full scale and the rotation is 000. Very important. Very important. Once you have your object nailed, it's the right size. It's in its ro rotation that it's going to be in. Apl apply it. Okay, that's number one. Number two, now we're going to move the I'm going to move the origin. Similar to what I did for the Simpson strong tie because I want to strategically place the screw right in the center of this hole. Here's how you do this. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is you can see that the origin of the screw is out sitting out here in space, so I am going to move that origin first. I'm going to tab into edit mode. You'll see if you import one of these screws or anything, a lot of times all the vertices are selected. And don't be surprised if the mesh looks a little unusual. A lot of times when you import 3D objects that were made in engineering software such as SolidWorks, Katia, Solid Edge, it'll look like this. Also, uh, I'm going to hold Alt and I'm going to right click to select this edge loop. And sometimes Blender doesn't really recognize this as an edge, edge loop. Um, I, I don't know why, I'm sure somebody does. Um, so when that doesn't work, you just have to kind of get creative on how you're going to select the edge loop. I'm gonna press Z to go into wireframe mode, and I'm gonna box select all these vertices. The reason I'm box selecting these particular vertices is because I want this edge on the screw to rest against the outside surface of the Simpson strong tie. So I'm kind of being mindful of where I want my origin to be, and so, I'm first of all selecting these vertices. Now I'm going to shift as snap my cursor to that selection. What that has done, has mo it has moved my cursor to the center of the screw, um, but also to you know to the center of uh, of the surface I want to snap. 
So I'm going to A, deselect those vertices, tab into object mode, control shift alt C, and move the origin to the 3D cursor. Now the origin is where I want it to be. Now if I press R to rotate and press Y to the Y axis, you know, I'm gonna animate this, the action of this screw and now it rotates where, the way I need it to uh, because my origin is where it needs to be. Second of all, to snap the screw to this strong tie, I'm gonna right click select the strong tie, tab into edit mode. I'm going to alt, right click to choose the um, edge loop. It didn't select the entire edge loop, so I'm gonna press alt, shift, right click to continue selecting the entire edge loop. I'm going to shift S, snap my cursor to the selection, A to deselect it, tab back into object mode, control shift alt C to snap my origin to the 3D cursor. I've done the two steps I needed to do. I strategically placed the origin of one object and I strategically placed my 3D cursor. I'm going to shift S, snap my selection, the screw, to the 3D cursor and now the screw is exactly where I want it to be. I'm not going to get too worried about the fact that I can see the Simpson strong tie through the screw. A um, little bit of model, changing the model. Maybe I could do a countersink on this hole on the Simpson strong tie. And I, I don't really find it necessary for this, so that's why I'm not worrying about it. Um, but now the screw is right where I need it to be. In fact, if I press G, Y, G grab Y on the Y axis, and you can see that screw is right in the center of the hole. So now I have got the, my screw placed. Okay, let's animate this assembly. Now, now that we've put so much effort into putting together our assembly, let's go to the end of the timeline. We're going to record keyframes for each part in their assembled state. Then we're going to work backwards, move them into a disassembled state, and record the keyframes at the beginning of the timeline so that when the animation plays we watch this assemble. Okay, um, you don't have to do it this way this is just how I've found myself doing it but um, first of all let's go to the render panels if you haven't done an animation before the frame rate by default I believe is 24 frames per second so uh, just make a selection, the NTSC standard I believe is 29.97 um, that's what I'm going to use here uh, the reason that you want to be mindful of that is um, if you want something to go into its assembled state and you're thinking, you're kind of envisioning it taking maybe, I don't know, three seconds well, three times three seconds times 30 frames per second, that's 90 frames. So you want to record a keyframe in the assembled state, and then you want to go backwards 90 frames to record its disassembled state. So just be mindful of that, for instance. I'm going to go to the end. The, currently, the timeline, this animation is 250 frames long. So what is it? 250 divided by 30. we got about an eight-second video right now. Uh, I'm going to bump that up to 400 frames. Don't get too worried about these numbers. You can change them later. Don't worry about your keyframes, your positions. You can move them and change them. It's no problem. In fact, I'll show you how to do that. I'm going to right click on this 2x4. I'm going to go to the end of my animation. I'm going to go around. I'm going to go to about frame 360, I'm guessing. I'm going to press I to record the location. I'm not going to scale or rotate this particular object so I'm not going to worry about recording the lo the rotation or scale I just want the location I'm recording at the end of the timeline because this, it's in its assembled state as you can see first of all at the bottom left here the orange text indicates that there is a keyframe for that object at this moment in time frame 360 there's also uh, it, this these panels at the top right this location turns yellow to indicate that there's a keyframe. If I if I go into my timeline and press my left arrow key to move one keyframe, you can see that the text at the bottom left turns white, and the panels at the top right here are now green, indicating that there is a keyframe for this object. You're just not on it. Okay, so I've recorded a keyframe for that two by four. Now, Blender will do the math for you if you want it to do it. 
watch as you click in this panel here at frame 360 I know I want to go back three seconds three seconds times 30 frames per second it's 90 frames I'm gonna put in minus 90 boom I just went back to frame 270 I'm gonna press G for grab Z for the z-axis to move my 2x4 up left click to set it I'm gonna press I to record that location so now I have two locations recorded in time so if I press Alt A, which is the keyboard shortcut for play, or you can click play forward here. Uh, but if I play it, now I can watch my 2x4 move into its assembled state. And that's what I mean by kind of working backwards. Okay, so that 2x4 has animation keyframes recorded. Okay, now I want to animate the second two by horizontal 2x4. Two by I want it to enter into the assembly at a little bit different time than the first one um, now in your in your timeline navigation bars down tools down here the you have the play forward and play backward buttons um, then then the button next to that the double arrow is to jump to previous or next keyframe um, just to let you know now I want this other 2x4 to maybe enter the assembly 30 frames sooner. So I at the I'm gonna to go to the assembled state of this two of this first two this 2x4 two that I've already animated. I'm going to go backwards in time in the during the timeline, negative 30 frames. And I'm gonna right click on this other 2x4, press I to record location. So it goes into its assembled state just a little bit sooner than the other one. I am going to, um, let me see what this is called, current frame field. Go into the current frame field. I'm going to go back 90 frames. I'm going to move this other 2x4. It's going to be a little bit, maybe a little bit lower than the first 2x4. I'm going to record that location. I'll press Alt A to watch my animation. You can kind of, you can kind of see how this is beginning to work. And you, this is where you get to be creative and do what you you want to do. Um, but you can see how that works. Okay, now I'm going to record the location keyframe for the Simpson Strong Tie. First of all, I'm going to insert a keyframe for its assembled state. I'm going to go to the current frame field, type in minus 90 to go back three seconds, 90 frames. G for grab, Z for the Z axis, move it. Press I to record its disassembled state, record that location, and now that one has a, a keyframe. Okay, this needs a little bit of tweaking, but this is good, we're getting the keyframes roughed in. Now I'm going to animate the screw. Now I don't. I want to animate the screw location and the rotation. I want to actually animate the the, the action, the motion of a screw being fastened. So I'm going to grab the Simpson Strong Tie. I'm going to jump back to its disassembled keyframe. Um, actually, the screw is going to be one of the last things to go into this assembly. So I'm going to go to the very end where the last 2x4 it goes into its assembled state and I'm gonna go another I'm gonna actually type in plus 30 frames for the screw and I am going to press I to record the location and the rotation so I'm gonna type, click on the lock rut there lock rut and as you can see on this panel here, the location and the rotation fields have all turned yellow. Okay, now I'm going to back up. Uh, yeah, I'll go 90 frames, minus 90 frames. Press G to grab, Y on the Y axis. I'm going to move this screw out of the way. And um, I'm going to go ahead and record the location and rotation. What I failed to do was I, I've recorded rotation zero zero zero. Um, I've recorded that rotation for both keyframes. So I'm going to jump forward back to that 
first keyframe, the assembled state. I'm going to press R to rotate and Y to rotate on the Y axis. And as I rotate this thing manually, you can see in this field that the um, the angle is the angle is increasing. So I'm just guessing I'm going to change the rotation angle to 1080 degrees at this keyframe. And this, to re-record a keyframe, you simply just press I again and click on location rotation, and it has re-recorded the new data. And so now when I go back in my um, timeline here and press Alt A, you can actually see the screw rotating. So that is how you would record the location and the rotation. Now, um, let me show you how to kind of tweak your animation a little bit. If you hold the control key down and left arrow twice, what you're looking at here is the animation screen layout. Uh, if you click on this choose screen layout button, um, the default screen layout is your modeling you know, default screen layout, but animation shows by default it's laid out showing your keyframes in what is called the dope sheet, and then you also have this F curve modifier. And this is a good, this is where a great place to kind of tweak your animation. Let me also show you, I'm going to press control right arrow twice to get back to my default screen. I'm going to right click to choose my screw. First thing I'm going to do to tweak my animation is I, I'm watching the screw go in and, and maybe this doesn't matter to you but just in case it does. Um, as I'm watching the screw go in, I'm watching the final little rotation. It's kind of not really rotating anymore. It's kind of just sliding in there at the end. Well, if you want to tweak, you can tweak the rotation curve. Um, well, there's something I was going to show you first. You can tweak the rotation curve um, a little bit, kind of like you would a Bezier curve. It, it really acts just like a Bezier curve. The first thing I was going to show you is that I have the shoot the screw selected. I'm going to control left arrow twice, and this arrow here beside the ghost, it says only include channels relating to selected objects and data. I'm going to just click that, and now in the F curve modifier and up in the dope sheet, the only thing we're seeing are keyframes and curves related to the screw. That's really helpful because you can you can get a really big mess going on the bigger your assembly is and the more keyframes you have. So if you're looking at just what you want to see, then it, it, it helps. Okay, down here in the F-curve modifier, in the curve modifier, I'm going to click on this location rotation keyframe drop down arrow. And location rotation has recorded the X, Y, and Z location and the X, Y, and Z rotation. So if I click on this Y Euler rotation, because I know I only, I know I only changed the Y rotation value. And so it shows me the curve for that rotation um, from zero degrees to, oops, to 1,080 degrees. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, like I said, Changing the curve is just like changing the Bezier curve. You have these control bars, and as you move them, you can kind of see that green curve changing. And so what's happening is the rotation is either extending or it's it's lasting longer or what have you. You can even change these control handles by pressing V to free vector align, just like you would a Bezier curve. So I'm gonna I'm going to make that rotation last a, bit, a little bit longer by moving this control handle in and changing that curve a little bit. Again, you have to experiment and you have to practice um, with this. So I changed the curve a little. I'm going to press control right arrow to see how uh, Alt A and watch my animation again see how that looks. That's a little better. I'm gonna, I don't know, I'm going to change it maybe a little, I'm going to change it a little more. I like that a little better. 
it seems to be an appropriate rotation for installing a screw. That I like that. So that's how you would um, kind of tweak, kind of tweak the action. You know, as you, when you see things going into their assembled state, they have a motion and then they begin to, they have a pretty, they start moving kind of slow and then they have a, and then they start going into their resting position kind of slow and that has to do with the curve. Um, now again, let's say, uh, let's say for instance, I don't like, I, I don't like the fact that it's taking so long for this second 2x4 to move. I want it to move a little bit sooner, so I right click to select it, I press control left arrow. Um, the, when you're modifying, when you're changing your keyframes, these diamonds are your keyframes, you can press A to deselect and deselect, G to grab, all the tools are pretty much the same that you would use in your uh, in, in model space when you're modeling things. So I'm gonna press A to grab all the keyframes. I'm gonna press G to grab. I'm gonna type minus 30. I'm gonna move it back 30 frames. Control right arrow twice to get back into my default screen layout. And as you can see, now the you can see the change in the animation there. But that, that's how you would move keyframes around. Um, you know, I can just move the, the first keyframes. Maybe I want this one to move in 60 seconds instead of 90. So I'll press G for grab 30 to move it 30 frames forward in the animation. And now there's just 60 frames between the two keyframes and we'll see how that looks. It just depends on what you're wanting to accomplish. You have to kind of experiment with that. Okay, one last thing I want to show you. Okay, let's say for instance your assembly has multiple screws or bolts. If you duplicate a, something that has keyframes, the keyframes also get duplicated. So if I was to play this animation or move along in my timeline, you're going to see that second screw snap right back to the location of the first. So if you need to delete keyframes, my suggestion is to you know, kind of be mindful of where you want the object to be. I want it to be in the assembled state. So I'm going to dis delete the disassembled state keyframe first by pressing Alt-I and deleting the keyframe. Then I will go jump to the next keyframe and Alt-I delete that keyframe. Now I can move my screw and it's where it needs to be. Now again, if there was a hole there, I would need to use my snap tools to snap it to the hole. Um, but you know, if you duplicated something that has keyframes, you need to delete the keyframes. Now you could, if you wanted, if you had several screws or bolts and you wanted them to all be animated individually because you want them to go in at different times, you could do that. But if you're not concerned about, if you're, you're okay with several screws or bolts being assembled at the um, same time, I, I suggest using the copy rotation and location restraint. It's really handy. That is here with the, at this chain add object constraint. I'm gonna first of all copy location. You have to know the name of the object you're copying. And this is screw 8 because you need to choose that as a target so I'm gonna start typing in screw and I can see screw 8 here now it's jumped it's jumped to the current location of the screw I only want the Y location so I'm gonna uncheck X and Z so now when I move along my animation timeline the location of the first screw is being copied by the, the second screw now I also want to copy the rotation, so I'm going to add another object restraint. I'm going to copy rotation. Again, I need my target, which is the screw, the first screw. And I only need to record to copy the Y rotation, so I'm going to uncheck the X and Z. And now as I watch my animation, I can see that both screws are moving and rotating at the same time. Now it's beneficial to 
shift D duplicate that second screw because those object constraints are recorded. So now every time I duplicate that second screw, I get the benefit of, of duplicating those object constraints. And it would just be a matter of snapping that screw to the hole in the, in the strong tire, whatever object, um, just to get, to get it aligned. And that is the workflow I use to align objects in an, in, a, in an assembly and the workflow I use to animate an assembly. Okay, thank you for watching.